possess his spear, Steel Peach Electric Arc Reorganization, a major technical development in steelmaking and a major problem in industrial relations. The jobs of more than a thousand men are threatened by the building of the largest electric melting shop in the world. Today, the first of six electric arc furnaces goes into operation. When the whole scheme is completed, they will produce more steel in any one week than the 21 open hearth furnaces at Templeborough and Rotherham that they are replacing. British steel industry is setting the world an example in good labour relations as well as in technical advance. There have been no threats of strike or violent clashes between management and men in spite of many grave human problems and individual cases of hardship. The scheme will cost over 11 million pounds, but in the end a team of men on one of these furnaces should produce 110 tonnes of steel in 3 hours and 20 minutes instead of the 10 to 12 hours it took in the older furnaces. The object of the operation is to make steel cheaper. In the past, it took much longer. Seven of the furnaces that are being replaced were in the melting shop at Rotherham. They were small by modern standards, being limited to 65 tonnes. Steel prices had become more and more competitive as steel making methods improved throughout the world. With all their skill and keenness, the men in the Rotherham melting shop knew that they could not make steel as fast or as cheaply as those in more modern plants and had been well aware for some time their future was threatened. We at Rotherham melting shop knew years ago that the old shop would, not be, would have to close down uh, due to the department being unable to compete with these modern techniques that are arriving in the steel industry. And to ensure that we protected our members, we agreed with the management that we should not allow any other men to work on the furnace teams. As a result, when men left or reached retiring age, only temporary staff were taken on, and fewer men were left at Rotherham with claims to jobs in the new shop. Steel is made much faster and cheaper in the modern steel works at the Appleby Frodingham branch of the United Steel Companies in Scunthorpe. These are also open hearth furnaces, but they have a capacity of from 250 to 350 tonnes. They also work fast because they are near to blast furnaces and can be fed with molten iron. Almost the only cold metal that has to be heated is that from their own steel making scrap, and even that will not be used when spear is complete. With hot iron and modern oxygen techniques, these large open hearth furnaces can compete with all others. There is no supply of hot iron available for the furnaces at Steel Peach, and indeed, cold pig iron is sent from Scunthorpe to Rotherham. The chimneys at Templeborough marked the other furnaces that needed replacing. For over 40 years, this had been the longest melting shop in Europe and the Commonwealth, stretching for approximately a third of a mile. The furnaces had been modified many times, but they had reached the limit of their development. In spite of the use of modern oxygen techniques, it was impossible to do a complete melt of 110 tonnes in less than 10 to 12 hours, which was slow by modern standards. For example, all the scrap had to be charged in small quantities. It is a tribute to the men and management that the 21 open hearth furnaces at Steel Peach had reached a combined total output of just over a million tons of steel a year before Spear started. It was vital for Steel Peach and Tozer to keep production going to meet its obligations to its customers as the new furnaces were built. And this is how it was planned. At Templeborough, there were the 14 larger open hearth and at Rotherham, the seven smaller furnaces. 
These 21 furnaces had a capacity of 22,000 tons of steel. And for the purpose of illustration, we have represented capacity in 1,000 ton units. Phase one consisted largely of clearing one end of the site and organizing new roads for delivering raw materials. It had little effect on production. Phase two saw three open hearth furnaces demolished with a corresponding reduction in capacity. The installation of the first electric arc furnace will restore some of the capacity lost from the open hearth furnaces. Phase three sees another open hearth furnace go out, but the second electric arc furnace brings further capacity. Phase four closes the seven Rotherham furnaces and two more at Templeborough. Open hearth capacity is down to half, but another electric arc brings it up. Phase five loses two more open hearth and brings in another arc. We are now over the hump and capacity should be going up. Phase six brings overall capacity up to 27,000 tons. With phase seven complete, Spear reaches its target capacity of 27,500 ingot tons of steel per week as compared with the original 22,000. But before this plan could be put into effect, it was essential to be sure of keeping the full support of the men. This was up to the management. We were quite determined right at the very beginning to let our work people know what was going to happen. We did not want them to hear about the scheme via the grapevine, and we certainly didn't want them to read about it in a newspaper. The senior management of the company... Here are some of the trade union officers and branch officials who met the management on that first day. Such get-togethers have become a vital part of Spear, and the men have been taken into confidence from that very first meeting. This was followed by a statement to the press who carried the story in their next issue. The real point is this. It is reasonable to assume that no one belonging to Steel Beach and Toza could have left the works that day without knowing of the scheme because they had been told. Negotiating was tough. There would be fewer men in the new melting shop. Many would lose well-paid jobs, and even if they still worked in a melting team, they might have to take lower-paid positions. Nevertheless, the men all realized that Spear was essential in the present highly competitive conditions, and they also knew that the management were doing their best to be fair. One of the principles that had to be laid down was that nothing questionable should be allowed to go through on the money. For example, Uncle George being able to put Harry into a job that another man was entitled to. In February 1961, work started in earnest. Technical planning was no simple matter. Unlike the majority of such major engineering projects, the new furnaces were to be erected on the site of the old open hearth furnaces. Inevitably, this would take a longer time than construction on a green field site. And the engineers had to use greater imagination in planning. The works, roads and railways had to be completely reorganized to handle the increased tonnage. The new furnaces will run entirely on scrap metal, which is more bulky than the mixture of scrap and expensive pig iron used in the open hearth furnaces and the railway marshalling yard had to be streamlined to cope with the extra wagons. All this was taking place at Templeborough, and not everyone agreed with the management's suggestion that the men from Rotherham should be regarded as having equal rights in selection for the new melting shop. We at Templeborough thought that none of the men from the Rotherham melting shop should have had jobs on the spear. After all, we changed from gas fire furnaces to oil fire furnaces, the same cranes, ladles, personnel, etc. And we thought that this should apply with the spear operation. Some of us at this moment still think the same way. All the same, the men at Templeborough agreed to accept the ruling of a neutral union committee. However, as the new furnaces began to take shape in another branch of United Steel at Distington, other problems arose. Electric arc furnaces are essentially simple without the complicated brickwork of the open hearth furnace. 
This alone would put some hundreds of skilled bricklayers out of work. More controversial was the fact that these furnaces are highly mechanized and the management thought it reasonable to ask for smaller teams of melters. Examples of the mechanization we're applying to these furnaces are automatic power input control, uh, mechanized means of adding finishings to the ladle and of adding oxygen, uh, mechanical methods of fettling. These we feel will minimize the sheer physical effort on the part of the melters and because of this we're only asking for three men per furnace rather than four. Yes, but we could not agree to these proposals. But after a series of meetings, we were able to arrive at a measure of agreement on all aspects of the money except that on the furnaces. And under our terms of uh, negotiation uh, and the machinery provided for such things, uh, we referred the matter to a neutral committee. The neutral committee considered three melters sufficient. And although the men did not agree, they accepted the decision without any interruption to the construction work. What could have been a real bombshell passed, but there was a surprise in store at Templeborough. open hearth furnaces were coming down. The men had agreed among themselves that the first opportunities should go to the more senior melters. In this destruction went many hopes of promotion for younger men. The company did all it could to inform all concerned of every possible alternative employment. A number of them took advantage of this and moved to Scunthorpe to join Appleby Frodingham. It's taken me two years to get up to the salary that I left at Steel Peach and Tolls us. But uh, the thing about that was that that money wouldn't have remained at such a, uh, a height. It would have dropped considerably had it stayed there. Although it's too, it would take me two years to get back where I was, as regards finance, that uh, I'm going on from there. And in the long run, I shall be far much better off yeah. over here. Some 30 families have moved to Scunthorpe and nearly all are settling down happily. Although moves like this almost always involve a loss in promotion and the domestic problems of finding a new home. Comes in, <coughs> gets here, and no Marley tiles down, only this black tar. Uh, one or two window panes missing, no gas, no electric on. A real performance. In fact, we cook for about what, two or three days on an old uh, private store. Yeah. What about my dinner? Spear was beginning to take shape. The buildings for the new furnaces were going up. This was a very big engineering scheme, and normally outside consultants would be called in. However, the project was bound up so closely with steel making that Steel Peach decided to control it themselves. It wasn't easy maintaining production. Buildings were coming down, and others went up, and yet vital links had to be kept going between the old and the new. Space for construction was limited, and temporary facilities had to be provided as the reorganization went ahead. going ahead on a tunnel under the main road. This would link the new melting shop with a canteen and other amenities. This new building was also to have a function that melters might find a threat to their individual status. It was to house a control room. Central control was first envisaged as soon as it was decided to change to electric power. The work on the new substation shows that this is no ordinary use of power. 
but indeed a load that will be equivalent to a town as large as Huddersfield. Without proper planning, such a load could throw the grid right out of balance. But a scheme was devised that would make it a balancing factor in the national system. Maximum demand would be strictly limited within half-hour periods, and the electricity authority would be entitled to call for substantial load shedding when so required, spread over a total maximum of 50 hours in any year. Everything about Spear is large. The United Steel Structural Company have built columns weighing 50 tons. These are for the Furnace Bay to support cranes that will lift 150 tons. Even as a new furnace is being delivered, new developments are taking place and men are considering how it can be improved on. Every aspect of the operation is gone over by steelmakers, engineers, and every kind of expert on machines, men, and money in the monthly meetings of the steering committee. When Spear began, these were to be the most powerful furnaces in the world, but already an increase in power is being considered. With fairly minor modifications, we can lift the power input up to a level of 50 MVA. We could go up to 60 MVA. Well, does the higher voltage give us any more power in the furnace? No, I don't think it does. Because there's plenty of there's a number of furnaces working today, ranging from 480 to 700 volts. I don't think there's any evidence this does us any good unless we can get more power in. So what you're really saying is that for the benefit of science, we're not willing to spend this money, or shouldn't be. Uh, but if there's any increased power, we should. What do you think, Albert? I agree with Mr. Howes. If we're not going to get any more power than they are, there's not much point in making this change. All right. Well, I think we can probably agree on that. But what about the increased cooling facilities? Early in 1963, the old melting shop at Rotherham did its last melt. These were the most uneconomical furnaces of all. And by a change in plan, it was possible to push forward the closing date. In many industries, such an event has triggered off a series of strikes. But in this case, the men themselves decided to give a party, and they invited the management along to join them. Gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity of offering a very sincere welcome to all my past and present colleagues to this dinner which has been arranged to mark the closing of the Rotherham Melting Shop. Many of us have worked in this department for a great number of years. We have been friends for a long time. The Rotherham Melting Shop has been a source of our livelihood and to see it close today was something of a blow to us all. And yet, that blow could have been more, far more severe. We could have all been out of a job. But thanks to the forward planning of our company, all of us have got a new job. Some in other departments of the firm and others in the new electric melting shop. There is no doubt that it would have been to take some of us a little time to settle down and readjust ourselves to these new jobs. But we are determined to try our very best to make this shop a happy shop and a prosperous one. And whilst we are sorry to see the end of this melting shop, which for so long has been our place of work, we have every confidence that in the new process and the ability of our company to be able to face any competition successfully, we, the members of Masbro number one branch of the Besector, are determined to do our utmost to ensure the success of this new steel making venture. Gentlemen, give me great, very great pleasure now to introduce our director and general manager, Mr. Kilpatrick. Chairman and gentlemen, it is not for me to uh, reminisce about RMS. What I would like to say to you is something simple and serious. <coughs> we are here to attend not a funeral party, 
but in one sense, a birthday. <laughs> It is part of the triumph of any large project like this to bring everything together at the right moment. One of the greatest differences in this new way of making steel is apparent in the control room of each furnace. Here are far more instruments than on an open hearth, besides all the switch gear for the mechanical aids. The melters selected for the new shop had to learn a great deal before they could be ready to take on their responsible new jobs. And many of them were no longer young. The company agreed to train men up to the age of 60 and over. And the union made the revolutionary and far-sighted agreement that their members would only be considered as melters for the new shop if they gained the city and guild's diploma in basic electric steel making. Yes, which is number 23. The success of the training scheme is assuring the men of the responsible position of melters in the future. They will be no mere button pushers in spite of the growth of centralized control. Now you're ready for power. Okay, Jack, let's check the controls then prior to putting on the power. We will put the uh, charge weight position in the uh, weight indicator in the correct position. Yes. We'll switch to the APIC program. We set the uh, regulator sensitivity control onto the course position. Yes. Uh, we now check to see that the independent uh, regulator uh, control is in the correct position. Yes. And also to check that the master control, electro control, is in position. Right, we're ready we now then for power, aren't we? Yes, we're we now ready for power. power on then. We turn the key to into the normal position and then close the breaker and the electrode is coming down and the power is now on. Central control had to come to make sure that the melting shop as a whole never exceeded the selected level of maximum electrical demand which would otherwise involve the company in thousands of pounds more on their annual power bill. But this is only one aspect and a simple one which it is planned to hand over to a computer. Central Control will be able to plan the best use of all the resources of the new shop in a way that was never possible before, for every melt requires important decisions to be made as it progresses. Here, decisions can be made with more information and a wider view than ever before. Let us see just what happens as one of the new furnaces carries out its routine work. With the new furnaces, expensive pig iron is no longer needed. This is all just scrap, the cheapest basis for steel. It is carefully sorted in the new sorting bays and mechanically loaded. Steel peach can now take all the cold scrap from Appleby Frodingham steel making instead of pig iron. Spear is helping to make two branches of the company more efficient. There are four furnaces working in early 1964 and Spear is moving smoothly towards its finish. Prices have gone up everywhere. The steering committee keeps a wary eye on the situation. Now the phase seven estimate has been approved, can you tell us what the global estimate for Spear will be? Yes, well I can say that at this stage that the revised global estimate will now be 11.44 millions. This compares with the original sanction in 1960 of 10.75 millions. In other words, we're going to have an increase in cost of £690,000. How is that made up? Well, there are two reasons. One, the normal price increases, over which we have no control, as you appreciate, account for £485,000, and additional equipment, £204,000. The first hand melter is now ready to charge the furnace. <laughs> Instead of laborious loading through the door, he dropped 80 tons in one go.
ground charger is still used, but only for adding the small quantities of material needed to make the steel meet its specification. steel should now be pure enough to fulfill the specification, but nothing is taken for granted. A sample is taken and will be rushed by a high-speed air tube to the laboratory. Two Quantavacs analyze independently each half of the sample and the results go into another computer. In the laboratory, every second counts when a furnace crew is waiting to hear an analysis. 30 shillings a minute is a broad reckoning. Within five minutes of the sample leaving the shop, ten elements have been assessed and the results rushed back to control and to the first hand by teleprinter. Eventually, the steel is right on specification and the furnace is ready to tap. has a job of this size come through on schedule. But this time, the plan has been matched by progress, a considerable tribute to the company's engineering staff who undertook this immense project with little outside assistance. Spear is ahead of target. From these giant furnaces pours an ever-increasing flow of steel good steel and cheaper steel to satisfy the ever-growing demands of our expanding economy and our world markets overseas. There have been men who said, you can't make good steel and make it fast. Others have said, men are too old at 50 to learn new skills. Experience has shown that new labor-saving techniques lead almost inevitably to head-on clashes between labor and management, and few unions have insisted on their members meeting the educational requirements needed to take full responsibility for the elaborate equipment of the future. Spear is making many people think again. Uh -huh.